Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome as we have this very important discussion for the Black community. So welcome, panelists. We're going to get right to it. So ready? Ready. All right. So I'm going to start with asking each panelist to briefly introduce yourselves and share how you think about AI ethics in your current role. So I'm going to start with Noble. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, and thanks to Bloomberg for putting uh, such a wonderful event together. Very timely, very important. I'm Noble Ackerson, uh, Director of Product uh, and uh, Emergent Technologies at Ventera. We're a mid-size uh, technology consulting firm in the Washington, D.C. area. My team uh, supports the federal uh, business unit and the commercial. So on a Monday, I might be supporting USDA. And on a Wednesday, I might be supporting uh, 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 Sirius XM, Pandora, and in integrating their um, community of excellence for, for machine learning. Um, what, what does, uh, what was the lead question? So how, um, how you think about AI ethics in your current role? Yeah, this is a good one. So for me, <laughs> uh, for me, you see, ethics is often looked at as a constraint. Uh, to um, you know, achieving goals. You know, do not make sure you don't violate someone's privacy in order to achieve our goal. Um, I think that I look at it as quite the opposite. I look at ethics as um, an opportunity to look at goals that are worth pursuing. So in that case, it would be you know, uh, worthwhile goals like you know. Does our machine learning model or uh, the computer vision model um, alienate half the population or misclassify half the population? Well, that's bad business. Uh, that's you know model skew, uh, if you were to call it that uh, from a perspective of bias. Uh, and so that is not a worthwhile goal. Uh, and so that's, that's how I look at it. Thank you. We're going to go to Francesca. Same question. Do you want me to repeat it yes. for you? No, okay. no. You got it? All right. Uh, yes. Hi, everybody. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, so my name is Francesca Rossi. I work for IBM. I'm part of IBM Research. Uh, my background is in AI and computer science. I have a PhD in computer science. And I joined IBM eight years ago before I was in academia. So I was doing research in AI. Um, and uh, now at IBM, I continue doing research in AI, advancing AI capabilities, but really with the, the focus on how to make AI aligned to what we do. But besides this research role, I am the company AI ethics global leader, which means that, uh, for example, I co-chair the internal AI ethics board. Uh, IBM has put together this board, which is the centralized governance uh, with decision making capabilities of the board. It's not an advisory board. It's not a recommending board. It's a decision-making board about everything that the company does around AI ethics, from the tools that we develop, the educational material, the playbooks for our developers, the design thinking sessions, the risk assessment for the various use cases that are describing technology that we give to our clients. So that's uh, what I do internally at IBM, but also I uh, work around the AI ethics with many partnerships um, that IBM has externally uh, with the World Economic Forum, with the OECD, with the UN, with the partnership on AI that uh, IBM co-founded uh, together with uh, other companies, but also uh, civil society organizations already in 2016. And whose goal is really to understand together the best practices um, around, uh, you know, making AI beneficial for everybody. Thank you. And Anju? Hi, my name is Anju. I work here sometimes and sometimes very close by. I manage AI engineering for Bloomberg. Uh, I've been here for nearly a decade now, and uh, coincidentally, I was at the same facility, IBM Research, as uh, Francesca before that. Uh, I manage a team of around 300 researchers and engineers, and we build AI products across the board for Bloomberg. Um, Bloomberg's been using AI since 2009, and I think the way we think of uh, ethics, uh, let me think of a, a different way of putting it. So for those of you who don't know what Bloomberg does, here's a gross simplification. You know, There are companies and agencies, and 
and governments and they want to raise capital for ideas that they want to bring to the market and then there are investors and they want to invest their money in these ideas and we operate in a global marketplace which means that these issuers of products or securities and the people who want to buy them or resellers they actually are from all over the world from very different cultures and countries with very different values so the only way that bloomberg can provide transparency when we say transparency is actually offer information to all these parties on how should they think about making decisions so what kind of product should i bring to the market what kind of product should i invest in who should i buy from who should i sell to the only way we can do that is if we can lay bare all the information someone needs to make a decision in an ethical and unbiased way and to us it all starts with and we'll get into like you know the data the modeling the compute but at the end of the day it all starts with involving the right people from the get go and so like you know our team i think i stopped counting once the person from 36th country joined our team i think we're close to about 50 now and that kind of diversity in like how people grew up in their backgrounds both educationally and otherwise so you know we have people all the way from mathematics on one side and you know some people who are like physicists and and science majors or arts majors it really makes it a lot easier to ensure that your practices are ethical like the models that you're building are ethical so that's kind of how i think about yeah ethics. that's that's yeah. the one thing we definitely have here at bloomberg is culturally uh invasive to make sure we work as a company so i'm going to jump back to francesca and i'm going to ask you at a high level what are some of the biggest challenges that bias presents as it relates to the to the development of ai systems so of course i mean i don't need to say i mean everybody know that bias is a very important issue in ai especially uh, since when ai uses machine learning approaches because they rely on a lot of data that train these uh, machines and uh, so and data usually uh, can be also describing past uh, decisions made by humans and so whatever bias there may have been there then uh, these systems that are trained on those data can uh, replicate the bias and even amplify it uh, of course bias can be in- embedded into an ai system not just through the data but also in every decision that during the ai life cycle um and this is not because people are bad that they want to embed bias but because we are all biased and so that's why it's so important as you mentioned that the teams are as diverse as possible because we recognize each other biases so definitely bias is an issue there in machine learning approaches um and so one of the first example uh, if you may remember is the the exa- that was of an algorithm that was very deeply analyzed was the compass algorithm that uh, used in uh, criminal justice in the US and that uh, gives a score of uh, how probable it is that somebody is going to reoffend uh and gives it to the judge the score and and uh, an analysis of this algorithm showed that uh, that was trained on past decisions of judges in the past analysis of this algorithm showed that is uh, um according to a, a notion of fairness which may you know for example you you may say okay i say that this algorithm is fair so not biased if it has the same accuracy for all the groups like black and white people for example and this algorithm indeed has the same accuracy but once you go inside and you look a little bit better and you look at the landscape of the errors that it makes so same percentage of errors but here the errors are very different on for the two groups of people in some, one group the vast majority of errors are false positives so very high score when it said it should be low and for the other group is completely the opposite and especially for black people a lot of false positive for white people a lot of false negative so that shows you two things first of all that the algorithm is biased yes but also that there is there is already a challenge because there are v- many different definitions of fairness and you have to understand which one is the most appropriate for a certain algorithm deployed in a certain scenario because if you don't get the right appropriate definition of fairness that you may miss that the algorithm is actually not behaving in a fair way another example is the do you want me to stop <laughs> I, I, let me let me some, no. let me close up close. So that's, that's the thing one that example there are many examples that you can have but uh, really the important thing is to remember about bias and many other issues that these are not 
technical issues only. These are social technical issues. So building the right tools to detect and mitigate bias is very important and fundamental, but definitely that's just the first step. And it's the easiest step. You need to change the culture of the people. You need to invest in education, in you know, uh, helping people understand these uh, issues from a social technical perspective. Thank you. I think this is a perfect segue for Noble. And the question is, what are some of the challenges in terms of educating both consumers and practitioners about AI biases? Wow. Yeah. Um, there are a couple things. Awareness being one of them foremost. Um, you know, Francesca talked about, you know, fairness. There's certainly um, no single definition of, of fairness, which makes finding the right metric very hard to solve for. Uh, both on the technical side, but awareness from the perspective of the consumer uh, as well, or even the, the end user uh, as well is, is, is a problem. And that sort of manifests in, in different ways. When we talk about ethics, uh, we're talking about a couple different things. Fairness and bias is certainly one. You can't talk about fair, uh, bias without talking about fairness. You're talking about privacy uh, as well. Uh, you're talking about uh, um, the interpretability of these models. Uh, I, we, I work with a lot of uh, state and agency, state and federal agencies, and and you know some of the impacts of the work that I do go to determine whether uh, a single mom gets a loan or gets a home uh, based on, on on that. And if you've ever seen one of those TAMF letters, uh, where you know someone who may have may not have a college education may frankly not know what to do with that letter uh, because it just got spat out from a model. If the data scientists can't explain it without an explainability model, I doubt um, someone um, you know who's just trying to raise their kids uh, can do the same. So, privacy, fairness, by certainly, but interpretability and explainability of these models in a way that consumers can understand, certainly the decision makers can understand, and also um, everyone in between. That that's a, a core piece. As far as how to educate, you, once you got the awareness thing down. It's not easy because you also have sort of cultural um, issues. Yeah. You know, what may be a social norm uh, for an American uh, may not be from someone over in Exactly, Europe, yeah. right. And so you've got those cultural barriers that sort of come into play. Uh, and I could go on, but, I, you know, it, it is... There's also the, the obvious complexity of what we're talking about. Uh, most recently, generative AI has sort of just stolen the show. Uh, and companies, um, you know, far and wide, generally don't have the funding of an IBM or um, a Microsoft or a Google. So they, they either, you know, subscribe to a service uh, from OpenAI uh, or or Google's Palm models, uh, where they have no control over the models. Uh, or they might download an open source version of it for whatever reasons. And, and so with that comes, you know, that black box that we started out with, with traditional models uh, and being able to sort of understand what, what's going on. It's very complex. We're still trying to figure it out, but we still are being forced to sort of put it out there uh, to affect change and hopefully bring positive value. So that's, those are the... The, the kind of numbers that I sort of enumerated out here. In a, in a New York two minutes yeah, that I you know. can uh, sum up. Yeah. Uh, so this question is going to be for all three plan panelists, and I'm going to start with and Anju. Given that, given that, everything that has been said so far, how do we prepare for an AR future so that the black community is not left out? Yeah, I mean, one, I want to make sure that when I played tennis, people said, call out what you're going to do and that way you'll remember. So I want, I want to say that I'm optimistic regardless of what my tone is. Because the big thing that AI brings to the table is the ability to measure. It's one thing that the models are doing biased things or unbiased things, but fundamentally we have, AI doesn't work without measurements. So I'm actually optimistic that it'll bring more transparency into the process. But AI models are built with data, with modeling, and with evaluations. Those are roughly the three components, but there is a fourth component, which is the humans that produce the data, which is the humans that do the modeling, the humans that do the evaluation. And I want to go back to like, you know, what you said, which is about culture, right? And so that's why inclusion is very important and that every community has to participate in those three aspects of uh, acquiring the data, labeling the data, 
evaluating the models and in creating those models. And like, you know, my personal anecdote is, uh, I'm Indian, if you couldn't figure out with my accent, my wife's American, my family, everybody has been educated in English for generations now. So when my five, it's been almost 13, 14 years since my wife and I have been going to India. My mom and my wife still can't talk without paraphrasing because my wife, if I, she asks like, do you want coffee? She says, I'm good. My mother still doesn't know what I'm good means when <laughs> someone says, do you want something? So I think this is where culture really comes in and NLP won't fix culture that quickly without the right people being involved. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna jump back to you, Noble. Okay. Are there specific examples you have seen or read about about AI hurting and or helping in the black community? You know, I promised you when you posed this question earlier backstage that I wouldn't go on a rant, but recently we have nine minutes. We have nine minutes. You, can't. Um, you may have read, you know, some techno optimists out there uh, describe bias as Frankenstein stories. Uh, and so uh, you're sort of digging through uh, you know, examples. I sort, of, I sort of landed on very recent example in 2019, um, an algorithm, machine learning algorithm that was uh, built to, to predict uh, healthcare uh, support for 100 million Americans uh, was found to be biased. This was a study in science, uh, and so it's Science Magazine. Um, and this was based on how machine learning models are traditionally trained. Uh, you get lagging data uh, and behaviors from the past, uh, and you train, you go through a transformation, we call it machine learning training, uh, and transform that into a prediction or classification or uh, some sort of recommendation. Uh, well, it turns out that if, um, in some communities, black people don't historically spend that much on health. Uh, a machine learning algorithm might leave them out from being um, cared for. And if that is the only signal, um, you have issues. Uh, there are many, many examples uh, about that, uh, about things like that. Um, a classic example that I often cite is a little older uh, but when Amazon decided to re uh, roll out same-day delivery, um, they had a bunch of cities uh, and they ran through their models. Uh, and in Roxbury, Boston uh, region, uh, they decided not to roll out um, the decision. It's not that you know Amazon as a monolith is racist. Uh, and it's also not that they didn't really do the checks. They weren't singling out within their features in their model, singling out black neighborhoods, right? However, it turned out that proxy effects came into play or secondary effects came into play. That if you trained your model on affluence or likely to buy, uh, that correlated with, you know, uh, less affluent communities, which <laughs> happens to have people who look like me in it. And so same day delivery, I don't get, but this is a kicker of that story, is that if you overlaid redlining from the 60s and 70s over that Roxbury map, it was a one-to-one -one map, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So that's what we're having to deal with and that's what we're trying to, to solve. And there are other examples like mm -hmm. Compass and stuff like that, if you wanna. I am, I am gonna jump back to Francesca and ask how do we prepare for an AI future so that the black community is not left out? Yeah, so let me follow up one second for sure. with an internal example that shows also how we can help, you know, how we can move to the future. So when we put together a playbook for our developers to help them understand during the AI life cycle where to inject, you know, bias detection, mitigation, the governance steps and so on, technical steps and so on. We did some pilots internally with some uh, teams that were not aware of this thing, you know, of this playbook. So we gave him the playbook, we gave them the tools and they said, oh, okay, but in my project, uh, bias is not an issue because there are no protected variables here. Mm. So I don't need to do all these steps that you tell me to do, you know, about bias because I don't have any protected variable that, you know, uh, around the people, 
no? And and of course, uh, the the team. Why why was the team doing that again? Not because it was racist, because it was not even aware of this proxy situation that protective variables can be very correlated to other things that may be in the in the project. So I think that education is really uh, what what can help. Really. And this example shows that this team was not educated enough, was not aware enough of uh, the possible issues, and it was just taking a very strict definition of. If I have variables about people, features about people, then bias may be an issue, otherwise it's not. So really education and also for the future generations, I think that the important, much more important, the multidisciplinarity, even for people that uh, study technical, you know, mm-hmm. uh, domain in the technical domain, they need to be aware of the impact of those te- technologies into people's life. Do you have anything to add, Noble? Right, so I'm going to um, go to Andrea, and I'm going to ask, as practitioners, what steps can or should be taken to reduce the impact of bias in AI systems? Cool. How many minutes do I have? <laughs> you have some time. Okay. We're doing good. Well, okay. So I think it, one of the things that all of you should be optimistic about is you'll see common themes recurring, which means that the issues are concentrated and they are solvable. The second thing I'll say is mathematics, which drives machine learning, is a tool that you can use to undo a lot of mistakes that were made in the past that, like you said, are present in historical data. So you can actually use math for good there. And so as practitioners, I think the first thing that we should do is ask ourselves, if someone asks us to build a service or a model or something, ask ourselves, is this right? Should we even build it in the first place? I think that's just non-negotiable. Assuming that what being what's being asked is reasonable, then again I go back to like you know you have data, you have modeling, and you have evaluations, and in all three phases you can eliminate the bad biases and introduce the new and introduce the good biases. An example is uh, we deal with uh, so people who want to invest in stocks also want to know not just what is the revenue and the forecast of the companies, they also want to know what do consumers think about this company? Is the sentiment positive? Is the sentiment negative? So Bloomberg has a financial sentiment model. Now, even if I assume that this is only in English, and if I don't pay attention to the data, and we want to operate in a global model, where do you think most of the stories come from? Who do you think is writing most of the stories? Uh, what gender do you think they have, right? So the data is biased from a historical perspective. So I want to eliminate that bias. Then I want to go to some people who are called annotators or labelers and ask them, hey, do you, if you read this story, would you label this as positive or negative for the financial health of the company? Because I want to build a model that can replicate your decision making. Now, again, if I am thoughtless about who I am asking that question, the answers will all look similar and we've done these studies. So, Data, the first place where you can eliminate bias. Second, evaluations. If I, like Francesca said, roughly say, well, I have a test set of 100,000 news stories and I just want to see what is the accuracy of my model. If I don't pay attention to, well, the 10,000 news stories, most of them come from America, but I do want to service people who have companies in Africa, in, in India, in China, in Australia, things start breaking down. So I need to be really thoughtful about stratifying my samples mm. there as well. And the last thing is modeling. I did speak about the role of people, but in modeling, what I mean is, again, referring back to Francesca, trying to ask questions like, what kinds of features should I consciously eliminate because I don't want them to be used? Do I really care to know what is the gender of the CEO discussed in the company? Do I really care to know any geography that's discussed in the company? Do I really care to know the name of the person writing the story? What if it's William and tomorrow it's Mohammed? Should that change my decision making because the content is not different? So you need to be thoughtful about the model and what features it uses. Uh, But again, I think the easiest way to not overthink these and have a false sense of security that you can write a checklist for doing the right thing everywhere is to actually hire the right people. Mm -hmm. They'll catch everything. Things will be good. So we have a little bit of time. So really quickly, can we tell the audience how can they help, right, with this impact and how can you know the people in the audience help with the black community if you have two words each of you to say to the audience engage and educate okay uh, pass you i'll come back i need some time to think 
No, um, so for people that are building and working in AI, I think to make sure they understand that AI ethics is not an afterthought, is not a nice to have, is an integral part of building an AI solution. So data is important, you know, the building the model out of the data, but then evaluating the model and so on. But the governance in the ethics part is as important as the other pieces. And as, as was said earlier, is not also something that drives in a different direction than business value and be, but actually goes in the, exactly the same direction to, give, to have the right Great. applications rather than uh, being constraining the application. I'm going to make it like an AI model and copy. Engage and educate sounds good. Well, okay, there we go. <laughs> Everybody, please give our panelists a round of applause for this conversation. Thank you. <laughs>